Welcome to the Lightning Hour Special Edition, showcasing Lockdown Theory's upcoming production of Tough Trip Through Hell. These two beautiful people here are both playing the lead parts in it. I'm your host, Sasha Kerbel. I'm your host, Rochelle Henry. I'm your host, Rico E. Anderson. Tough Trip Through Hell is a dramatic comedy western set in Virginia City, Montana Territory in 1866. A troubled Civil War veteran named Sam Wilson comes to Virginia City to search for gold and his missing wife. He befriends Ezekiel Pompey, a former slave turned entrepreneur, and the one and only Calamity Jane. Sam quickly makes an enemy of the local sheriff, a former Confederate soldier named Henry Plummer, and his henchman known as the Innocent. So now we're going to take a look at the trailer for Tough Trip Through Hell, and then we're going to meet its guests. Welcome our guest, playwright Dr. Bruce Olive Solheim, PhD. <laughs> Director Rick Walters, who also stars as Sam Wilson. <laughs> Technical director Jordan Martin. <laughs> Actor Tommy Hasmark, who stars as villain Sheriff Henry Plummer. <laughs> and Rochelle Henry, who stars as Martha Jane Canary, aka Calamity Jane. <laughs> And Rico E. Anderson, who stars as Ezekiel Pompey. Woo! Woo! -hoo -hoo! Woo! The family Welcome theater. Everybody. <laughs> Lockdown theater, by the name of it, I guess you can all assume that it was launched during the time of when things were shutting down due to COVID-19. But throughout these eight months, the productions have digitally evolved a lot. So could you tell us about this evolution, how Lockdown theater has evolved, and how the theater started? My friend Gene, who was an actor, a really good actor and a good friend of, of Rick's and Rochelle's, and he inspired me to get this thing rolling, and then Rick did the rest. Awesome. Rick, can you uh, touch on that? Yeah, well, the you know, as an actor, you guys, uh, you know, in slow times, you start taking gigs. You're looking for gigs. Sometimes you take some of that to your agent. And table reads have always been, for me, you know, actors act. you got to find something to do. And uh, Bruce was putting out basically a call for a table read. And so the two of us kind of got together. And I had just had this conversation with a young man named Cedric Legend, who is not present today, but he's very much part of our family. He, he was the director of our last show. We had been talking about doing movies remotely, essentially, even before the lockdown. And we had talked about it like a decade ago. We were talking about the VR thing when it was still a nascent technology before people were doing it mainstream, before there was dev kits out there. And he's a mathematician and very much a programmer uh, of his own right. The idea was that we could put actors in a space and eventually you know put a put a skin on them put them in another world and then do it all remote so flash forward to last year when mandalorian came out and the volume stage the concept of the volume stage quickly turned this vr stuff where they were using digital three-dimensional backgrounds in a volumetric kind of stage and they did it live action by putting an actor on a stage 
surrounded by LED screens that lit the the talent as well as you know doubled for the background and the sets. It's really genius. It's brilliant. If you guys haven't seen behind the scenes for the Mandalorian, check that out because it's mind boggling. Essentially, what we're doing though um, is putting together a backstage for our actors to do what we're doing here. And it's two and a half miles down road from a table read, which is what it started out with. You know, one of the beautiful things about what's being done uh, in relation to Tough Trip Through Hell and, and other productions is we can do so much in our own homes and we can set up things like a green screen where we can have those backgrounds and, and just yeah. like you were saying, you know, taking us to those other worlds. and. It's so cool because I remember back in the day when a lot of these things would be very expensive and it would take one hell of a budget to be able to pull these things off. And it's not that it can't happen, but the playing field has been leveled a lot more in terms of most, if not all of us, to be able to do uh, wonderful work like this, like what we're about to do with Tough Trip and what you've also done in the past productions like The Bridge. We all know that Tough Trip Through Hell is an adaptation of an unpublished novel by uh, David A. Wilson. And uh, Bruce, I wanted to ask you if you could just kind of tell us about how you came up with the story mm -hmm. and also why this play, this particular story, what, what does it mean to you personally? What this play does and what the book did and what, the, uh, what we've created here does is take people back to 1866 in Virginia City, Montana Territory, and in a world that Jordan Martin has created for us, this 3D world, kind of like being in a in a video game, but it's real. You know, I mean, we are real people. It started with this novel that my friend David Wilson, who's a Vietnam veteran, unfortunately, he's in the final stages of uh, Agent Orange-related cancer. He was sprayed with Agent Orange when he's in Vietnam. He wrote this book many years ago and one of his biggest wishes was to get it published. Well, that never happened for him. And then he got very sick a couple of years ago. And I said, well, I can't get it published, but I'm gonna adapt it into a play, which sounds easier than it is <laughs> because a novel is very much in your head and a play is out there with the actors on stage usually. So it had to be adapted and that took a while to do that. But David, uh, Last time I talked to him, he was very excited about us doing this and very grateful. And so I feel very motivated to do it for that reason, for him. But beyond that, it is an authentic story based on some real life characters that did exist. Like Sam Wilson did exist. A lot of these other characters, like Sheriff Plummer existed, of course, Calamity Jane. And when we have some fictional characters thrown in there too. So it really transports you back to that time and I think it has some important lessons for us for today, specifically how people were treated. Now, the way I've written it and the way David wrote it and the way I adapted it, it's got some very authentic language. It's got some authentic attitudes of people that are no longer you know, acceptable today. But as a writer, as a historian, which I am, I have to present this authenticity. So viewers that'll see it will notice that, but it is authentic. You know, there's nothing, we're not sugarcoating any of people's attitudes at that time, which are still attitudes people have today, unfortunately. But I, I think it has a lot to say about the difficulties we face today. And it's a classic story of a person, an anti-hero who meets a very wise man. They are able to help each other, actually, as it turns out in the end. And it's a, it's a buddy story in a way, but two very unlikely buddies. I just think it's enjoyable for so many reasons. No, I think that the story is so brilliant, especially the way that you've adapted it for a play setting. It has such remarkable characters. You really took the time to research and make sure that the characters were authentic. And I know that you adapted it, but you brought so much life to it yourself for a theater setting. And I do love the comedy in it. I love the drama in it. I love the Western feel. I love the characters, their relationships relationship, their bonds. And I think that that's something people are going to really notice is how beautifully it's written both by you and David and how this cast is bringing together those relationships. We have four leading actors here. So could you please each introduce us to your particular character? And also, as Bruce just said, most of the characters are based on real historical figures. So I would like to know, what was your process of bringing these characters uh, to life? Ladies first, let's start with Rochelle. Well, I play Martha Jane Cannery, AKA Marthy, AKA Calamity Jane. Calamity Jane was a real Western hero, and she was outrageous. She was bold, she drank, she smoked, 
she fought. She was just such a different kind of lady for that time in that era. She really was a lot more masculine and she was a lot more of a fearless fighter. Nothing really scared her. And she had a lot of things that she went through in her life. She went through so many different trials and tribulations, so many bumps in the road that could have stopped her, but instead she just plowed full force through them and she proved herself to be a hero and she was a lot bigger and more outrageous than what you would think of as a lady in that time period. So I do kind of think of her as a, as a cowboy in that way where she, she really just hung with the guys. She knew how to handle horses, guns, knives. She knew all how to do that. Um, but she also had a very compassionate side. She always looked out for those that were in trouble. She wanted to help others. She was a very compassionate, loving person. And I think that something so amazing about this play is it does show those dimensions for her. And something I've loved doing is thinking of like who my references for her are. I could have used the version from Deadwood, which she's a lot more cynical and angry and a little more withdrawn. I mean, she still is bold and outrageous, but she's she's gone through a lot and you can really see it on her and she's carrying so much weight because by then she's in like her 40s. And she's had so much life she's lived. But in this version, because she is a teenager like me, I decided to play her as a young girl who hasn't gone through as much yet. She still has gone through a lot. She still knows how to handle herself. But she still is bold and fun. And she still sees the world in a much brighter way. So my, my inspirations for her are kind of a darker version of Jessie from Toy Story and also Ruth from Ozark. Those are my two inspirations. Because Calamity Jane, she knows how to whoop every man's butt in the Montana Territory. She's not going to let anyone get past her. And she will tell all the tall tales about her and Wild Bill Hickok. Because you know that there's no, there's no Martha Jane Cannery <laughs> without Wild Bill Hickok being in the story, right? And I think something so amazing about the story is... Uh, Marthy's connection to the characters. Ezekiel is like her older brother, an adopted older brother to her. They're kind of like Batman and Robin. He's the mastermind and she's his sidekick, but they work together so well. They have such a great working relationship and they're kind of ready to just take on the world together, which I really love about that. And when Sam Wilson comes into the story, they instantly welcome him with open arms, or at least Marthy does. She, you know, goes up and hugs everyone. <laughs> and that's a new person for her to, you know, mess around with, and, you know, they can go on adventures together. And, of course, we don't like Sheriff Henry Plummer. <laughs> love you, Tommy, but we don't like Henry Plummer. <laughs> Dang it. He does, except for Mount Mount Plummer, maybe. Ma, Ma Plummer is the only one. Hi, my name is Rose, and I play Ma Plummer. She is the mother of the sheriff, uh, Sheriff Plummer. She's a pretty ornery old lady, and I really like playing her because I get to be as mean and loud as I want to be. And uh, everybody knows that's Ma Plummer. It's been such a great experience working with this cast. They are just so great everyone is so terrific and uh bruce the uh author of the play is just brilliant and his lines are just incredible to speak so we had a lot of fun and i know you'll have a lot of fun watching us see you later <laughs> we'll talk more about her in a minute but yeah i'm so excited to play such an iconic character in western history and to bring her to life in my own way and to also bring to life the vision that Bruce and David Wilson and also that Rick has for the character. So I'm excited. You mentioned uh, your relationship with Ezekiel. So now I want to ask you, Rico, uh, what can you say about your character? Well, <laughs> uh, Ezekiel Pompey is, um, well, he's a former slave, um, all cowboy very much a made man in many respects, very respectful of himself, very respectful of his surroundings, but also very knowledgeable of the dangers of his surroundings, uh, not so much as uh, just a cowboy, but as a black man in a society that still does not look and view him as an equal, or in most cases, even as a man. So with all that said, he still sees the good in people. He still sees the humanity in people. He also sees 
the evil in people. But Ezekiel, what I love about Ezekiel is the fact that he represents a portion of the Old West that is not normally told, spoken about, featured in the way that the overall representation of the Old West is, and that is the Black Cowboy who did exist, existed very heavily, but again, you don't see that representation. The majority of the representation are white cowboys. And it's not to say that there has not been representations, say in Hollywood, but so few and far between, you more or less can't really even name a bunch of them like you can name Caucasian cowboys. I think the last benchmark would be Richard Pryor. But Zeke is, is something new people are going to love. Well done, Bruce. Really love how you described his experience. You know, that was good. Thank you very much. It's important to have that representation and to showcase what was back then, but is deliberately left out. And that's one of the biggest problems with history as a whole. It selectively excludes what was. And the Black Cowboy was a huge staple in the history of the Western. So when you have a character like Ezekiel, you're seeing representations of all different types of, of cowboys. And in a lot of cases, a lot of those cowboys that you see who are viewed as the heroes, those stories are taken from black cowboys. The Lone mm -hmm. Ranger, the template for the Lone Ranger is a black cowboy. Right. A lot of people don't know that part of history. So that's important, and I feel very honored to be representing it. Being the cowboy is dangerous, but I'm sure there was a lot of fun in living that life. So I love the fact that there's that representation. Tommy, let's talk about villains here. I play Sheriff Henry Plummer. There's some stories out there that he was a very, very bad guy. So I, I chose to uh, play that route. I feel like he was a war veteran. And in order to, to go through war, the things that you see, you have to kind of callous yourself and put yourself in a place that you can operate at a level that you don't freak out or panic and not defend yourself or your troops. These days, that translates into PTSD. I think for Sheriff Plummer, that just, uh, I kind of enjoyed that life and the thrill of the danger. And I kind of turn into uh, not a good person and just kind of part of my, my day to day. If I have to kill somebody, I have to kill somebody. I don't think I regard human life how it should be. Uh, I don't respect anybody, don't care about anybody. Uh, I like to instill fear in people and love to get my way. I'm having a good time playing with uh, Rico, Rochelle, and, and Rick here. It's just a lot of fun being a guy that, that people cannot absolutely stand whatsoever. And uh... <laughs> Irony is his last character with Lockdown Theater um, was in a production called The Bridge, which Rick and I also starred in. And his character was Angel. So... <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. it's a polar opposite character. He goes from playing this character that's Rick and I's saving grace. And in this role, we both hate him because he antagonizes us. Um, Cop, can you do me a favor and uh, tell me a story, please? Simone, of all the people that survived this jump, they all said the same thing. They regretted their decision the second they let go. They realized that their problems were solvable, that there were people out there who loved them and cared for them. There's hope. Those are some nice words, cop. You know, you're actually pretty sensitive for a big scary guy. <laughs> I'm not a cop, I'm a volunteer. You don't even get paid to do this? We don't, we volunteer to help. Well, aren't you nice? We're all here to help, Simone. We got bridge workers, security officers, even the California Highway Patrol. Chips. Yeah, they don't. They don't like that name. I know that it's your job, you know, to talk me out of this. But what do you know? about the pain that I'm in. I mean, how do you know what it's like to be me? Because 10 years ago, I was right where you are. You're lying. No, 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 I wouldn't lie to you. 
Oh, what happened then? I was on the cord, just like you, ready to jump. And then a bridge iron worker popped on the cord and he grabbed my arm just as I was letting go. Who was he? I mean, he had to be pretty strong. Yeah, he was. He was a bridge iron worker. So you see, I do know what it's like. Is that for real? Because I'm really, really confused. Hey, hey, come back, Simone, please. Come on. Let me out, man. Well, I had to do something. It's okay, Harry. But I have to do this. It's now or never, and I know that I promised you, and I'm sorry. But now I have to break that promise. Don't come any closer, please! I will jump. Okay, okay, hey. I just need to ask you something first. What? Can I have your cell phone? Mine's a piece of shit. Are you serious right now? Okay. Okay, okay, okay. Just say my name. What's your name? Yeah, yeah. It, his name is Angel. What? Look, he, he has wings. Come on, just hold my hand, close your eyes, say my name. Samuel Wilson. So Wilson with two L's, not one, is a Norwegian name. Samuel Wilson is the great grandfather of David Wilson, if that makes sense. So this is also a based loosely on a real person. And I don't know all of the correlation, Bree, so I won't speak to it, but this is, uh, <clears throat> Also a portrait, like Rico said about Zeke, this is a portrait of somebody who's come to Montana to find their way. And he's married and his Hilda, a, a full body redhead from what I gather, is somewhere in Montana, he doesn't know where. So he's made his way out there to find her and some gold. Um, maybe we find out throughout this, this show that maybe he's there to find himself too, a little bit. And he definitely does that in Virginia City. And when Bruce and I first talked about his character, we had kind of a one-on-one, -on -one and uh, he gave me a word that I'd never uh, heard before, and it's got a silent J in it. Uh, it's called Yontelovin. Um, Yontelovin, the Scandinavian principle, um, is basically that no man holds himself above anyone else. Uh, humility over hubris, kindness, and, and basically doing everything you do from love. And, it, and it's essentially what our friend Bruce is, you know, if you want to sum him up, Yontelovin would be the word you would use. But anyways, Samuel is uh, fun for me because I'm normally cast as the douche. I'm normally the bad guy, uh, typecast. I can play evil pretty well. It's weird being the bad guy. I don't know, Tommy, if you, if you can relate to this, but I've, I've been in a movie theater and like seeing people look over me like this when they're watching my performance because I'm so convincing as a douchebag. So it's very fun to play this guy because he's the opposite. He's curious, he's kind, and uh, he doesn't really want much from life, oddly enough. And he ends up getting it because he's, because he's kind, because he thinks that way. But what I really love about this is <coughs> it's kind of a story about America in a way, because we find our ensemble and it's a melting pot. And Samuel comes in as, as the outsider, the fish out of water, and he finds that everyone there is already a fish out of water. And we see these characters, Zeke and, and Marthy, and Hal Fan. Greetings. My name is Jeff Ferrata, and I play Hao Fan, a Chinese immigrant in the upcoming play, Tough Trip Through Hell. Hao Fan is an interesting character. He's a immigrant, and he is involved in a gambling enterprise with the Mr. Ezekiel Pompey. Hao Fan is practically fluent in English, but he tries to pretend to be a little bit ignorant around those when those are talking about him. 
As I said, I'm extremely excited to be in this play, Tough Trip Through Hell. It's based in Virginia City, Montana. I'm a Montana native. I've been studying Montana history since I was a little boy. And I just want to thank Bruce and everybody else that's been so, so invaluable in assisting me in this new venture of acting as How Fan in Tough Trip Through Hell. Um, and even Madame Dumont and uh, Lisa Little Bear, and we fall in love with them because we see them all working together for a common cause. Hi, I am Nicole Lockett, and I am playing the role of Madame Dumont. I'm very excited to be a part of this production. I feel like we are about to do something very special with the combination of live play and online streaming and the intricate technical details that the team is bringing to the table. It's just not anything I've seen anyone else doing and I'm really, really excited for everyone to see it. I'm really excited to see it. Um, and I think that the audiences are gonna find themselves submerged in this world where these characters live. Um, one of those characters being Madame Dumont. Uh, she, like almost everyone else in this play, is based on a real person. And I have had a lot of fun researching her over these past weeks. And, uh, you know, she's a woman of mystery and a savvy businesswoman, woman of her time whose allegiances shifted as they needed to. Her past is unclear, her motives are unclear, and I really think the audience is gonna have a good time trying to figure out who she is and what she wants, just as I have been doing over these past weeks. Thank you so much for coming along on this journey with us, and I really hope you enjoy the show. Hello, everybody. My name is Jackie Harada. I will be playing Lisa Little Bear in the production of Tough Trip Through Hell. I am super excited to be a part of this production and be able to share my character with you. Um, I really resonate with Lisa because she is an enrolled member of the Northern Cheyenne Tribe here in Montana, which is where the play takes place in Virginia City and I myself am an enrolled member of the Northern Cheyenne tribe here as well so it's really cool to play a character um, where we share the same culture and to show that representation of native people so it's really awesome that I'm able to play this part and do that. Um, Lisa is a really great character and she has such, such depth to her so look out for that. Um, I'm just super excited to be able to play her and show the representation of Native Americans in um, plays and just overall, so that's really awesome. Um, so look out for her super um, in-depth character. Um, she's not just like an emotionless person, but she's more than that, so look out for that. I'm really excited to share her with you guys and uh, hope you guys enjoy the play. Thank you. You're living in a world as hard and conditions as dire as it was in 1866, Virginia City. Uh, you needed all the help you could get. So the love that these folks like uh, has Rochelle described the relationship between her, her character and Zeke and uh, the love between my character and Hal Fan. Like Hal Fan, he's like, well, I'll beat myself out. But he says it in a way that's like endearing and loving, you know, that's that's his, his <laughs> love. It's about comedy. He's able to, and we've been going over this in rehearsal, it's like, you know, you have a drive, you've assigned to mind. It may say, be cool, but the intent is, I love you, for example. And he's doing that, and he does it brilliantly. This is a whole new part to our craft as actors now, isn't it? Because we have to we have to worry about lighting. You know, I've got different lighting pieces. Lockdown Theater has provided all of our actors with an actor's package. So they get they get the green screen, they get a two light solution. You know, a lot of people have already bought their own lights. Um, some of us have bought our own wardrobe items. Bruce has sent props to everyone. You know, we've got different mics that we use. All of that, you know, putting time together to set your stuff up, setting up your lights. It's, a, it's an entire department that does this for you or three departments that do this for you if you're on a TV show, it's, it's a big deal. So the craft now is not just journaling, it's not just doing the, the character study, it's not doing your homework and your research, it's all of that, and it's playing a cell phone or a laptop. 
and it's knowing where you are spatially in the frame and it's making sure that your hand doesn't go that way or that your eye line is right or all of that or for me the biggest problem is staying still yeah no i'll find something i'll find something Bye. Hey. It's you again. Can I bum a cigarette? What? Could I bum a cigarette? It, I'm 18. It's no big deal, ma'am. Well, I quit. Stick it down. Are you, uh, young people smoke e-cigarettes? <laughs> you mean vaping? No, yeah. that's... I'm an old-fashioned kind of girl. If I'm gonna smoke, it's gonna be for real. I'm sorry, but I couldn't help but hearing you. You having some trouble with your parents? Yeah, with the mom. Now, dad left when I was 10. Sorry. Don't be. It's the best thing that ever happened to me. Yeah, this is Harry. I'm on my way, actually. Not far. What is it? Don't just tell me. Wait, what do you mean she's gone? Well, did you stop life support? Oh, cardiac arrest. Gosh, I should have been there. Should have been there. Okay, yeah. Yeah, no, no, okay, thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm. I know this is your voicemail. But I wanted to hear your voice one last time. I'm sorry I didn't have the courage to take you off the light support. I know, I know that's what you wanted. I couldn't do it. I couldn't let you go, man. I hope you're okay. I hope you forgive me. I can't, I can't go on without you, baby. Goodbye, my love. And I'll see you on the other side. Um, we have like a, a brain um, in Tacoma, Washington, and that's, that's Jordan, who has built this world. And he is like, the reason when we first started this thing out, first of all, we had a full length play. And then we talked about how we would program it and how we should put it together. And this, there's a lot. I mean, we have over a hundred sound cues. Uh, how many different How many different backgrounds will we have, Jordan? Do you, do you have a, a rough estimate? 350. 350 frames. So um, when you're thinking about that, so there's five episodes. So you know, disperse those somewhat evenly amongst those five episodes. You're starting to do sound cues of three different types of sound cues. Okay, there's room tone, there's recorded music cues, there's sound effects. Then there will be ADR, then there will be pre-recorded video pieces, there will be video cutscenes, blah, blah, blah. Jordan is a one-man band, like an octopus, shaping all of this. But uh, before, before I let him like blow your mind with what he does, when we first started doing this, we didn't know how we were going to do it. And so that conversation happened between Jordan and my friend Cedric, who's not here with us tonight, but there, he's using uh, the same technology that's used for video games. Most three-dimensional first-person shooters, or uh, what do they call it, third-person or POV or what first-person view or whatever it's called. 
that's all made in Unreal Engine. And Unreal Engine is a uh, developer kit you can get, uh, and you can basically do anything you want with it. VR, and what we were talking about earlier with um, the Mandalorian was volumetric. And without going into the tech, what that means is we have a three-dimensional space that you can see depth in and what's called parallax. So as the camera moves, the background moves differently. Right. So anyways, I don't know. doesn't seem I don't like wanna, a lot. Yeah, I was actually going to, my next question was actually going to be about how we are creating the sets virtually mm. and also how we're bringing to life this Western feel all from home, whether it be the sets, our costuming, our props, all of that. So let's first start with Jordan talking about how we're bringing, bringing up the Western sets. Yeah, um, I'll start actually with the journey of how we got to decide to do it. Um, when I first got brought in, uh, it was Cedric who brought me in. Um, he didn't know what we were doing. He just said, you want to figure it out. We kind of just pulled up some software. We learned how it all worked and we, because we didn't know how the software worked. And we just um, figured out one way to do it. And then about a week before we did it, we found a better way and we completely changed over to that. And uh, we had to do that in like a couple of days. Um, and the first one, everybody was just sort of on screen and we played with the placement of where they were. Um, Cause that was the craft that we were comfortable with at the time. Uh, then when we moved on to the bridge from uh, This Is My Gun, we uh, decided to nail the green screens around and have everybody uh, key in. And uh, we did on that one, I did the backgrounds for that in uh, just a picture that I made um, in Illustrator. And then I wanted to do more, but it didn't, it, it was hard to make an alteration to a picture like that. So I thought, let's just put Unreal in the background and we can move the cameras and change it. And there's really, it's just, again, another creation where nobody was doing it, but nobody was doing anything we were doing. So we just gave it a shot. Luckily, there are a lot of uh, great assets out there with a dusty sort of Western appeal on them, uh, wagon wheels, et cetera, because video games cover that type of thing. So the assets were around and I collected them all up. We bought a few and I put it all in Unreal Engine uh, and then I just sort of, it's like we were stumped all of a sudden, like, what do we do next? And uh, so I just read the script again and again, listen to what everybody's vision is. And then we're at a point now where it's just kind of like, this is what's possible. These are the, these are our choices. Um, and trying to keep it the way that, you know, Rick wants it. Uh, and then do it. <laughs> the way it has to be done in some cases, there's, there's like one choice and we have to settle and stuff like that. Some things we still don't know how we're gonna do it, but we'll get it done in time. <laughs> make it happen. Sometimes you have to just make it up as you go, like Indiana Jones. You know? right. We'll make it happen. It's, it's interesting uh, having worked on the bridge and now working on Tough Trip because the bridge, the three of us, we all just stood basically in one spot, occasionally moving around but we were not moving as much. And the set was just on the Golden Gate Bridge. It wasn't multiple sets. It was just set on one day on the bridge, three characters talking. This one is a lot more complex. We have a much larger cast and we also have numerous sets. The story, the pieces of the puzzle are all coming together and moving around so fast. So I think that it'll be really cool for people who thought that the bridge was advanced because I got a lot of people telling me, wow, that's amazing that you made a set. Well, this will be even cooler, guys. This will be, this will be bigger and bolder and badder. So, yeah. No, it's really cool. It's so wonderful to be a part of this, this addition to a medium that is still exciting to work in. The beautiful thing about us as creatives is we will find a way to make it happen one way or the other. And I'm not just saying as actors. I'm saying from behind the scenes. I mean, look at where we're at right now and look at what we cannot do currently, but look at how we just, because this is just how our brain is wired, we're just like, okay, we can't do it like this, but if we take that, that, this, twist that around and make that, ha ha, we got a show. If you were to take all the creative equity that the whole lot of us have, I mean, that's, that's a big ball of creativity. But, 
But you make it happen. I know another challenge that obviously we would face is when, like, it's easy for two people to be able to talk to one another from screen to screen. And even if we weren't looking directly, even if we were looking to the side or looking like this, like we're actually talking to somebody, that's cool. But then you have the other aspect of if it's, say, an action sequence. How do you pull off an action sequence? Because unless the person's right there with you, you're kissing air, you're punching air, hopefully you're not doing both at the same time. <laughs> it takes uh, some, some, some things to make it happen in this type of virtual world. So um, how is it possible uh, for the stunts and the action sequences to happen virtually for Tough Trip Through Hell? Well, the thing about those, we, we wrote them all down and I called it stunts because uh, that's kind of what they are in this case. And uh, I just went through and I thought about them. Some of them could be done technologically. And I was actually a little relieved uh, when they could be done technologically, even though it was work, it was all lined out. But when it was more of a movie magic answer, uh, where we had to kind of go back and think about how you fool people into thinking something happened, um, then it's just all about uh, meditation. Just think about how you uh, how editing works, maybe studying, I think would be a good way to get going on that. Uh, because that's what you still have to do when you use, we are still on green screen and we're still overlays. So we can't go too far. There's no um, real uh, way to interact with someone still. We have to fake everything. So uh, performance. yeah, we don't call it faking Jordan. We call it acting. <laughs> <laughs> right. Emma Rusticus is our musical director at Lockdown Theater. She did the music. Uh, her group, Lucky and Sparks, <laughs> what happened to Rick? Uh, they did the music for The Bridge and are doing music now for Tough Trip Through Hell. And we actually have a musical chorus here in Tough Trip Through Hell. Uh, the Innocent Hen Henry Plummer's gang, they, uh, they sing. So uh, actually, could you... Uh, Bruce and Rick actually tell us a little bit about what Emma's doing and about the musical side of this play. Well, I, I can just tell you from the writer's standpoint, that's where I departed from David Wilson. He had the characters, the innocents, in, in his novel, right? And I, I couldn't let it go. I mean, it just was so cool to me that they were called the innocents and they were terrible villains, you know? I mean, it's, what a perfect name to cover their dirty deeds. Hello there, I'm Toby Gebert and I'll be playing Red in Tough Trip Through Hell. Red is a former Confederate soldier and now a henchman in Montana Territory. Uh, he has his uh, comrades, uh, white and blue, and they form a Greek chorus, uh, which is something every Western needs. So I uh, hope you uh, check it out. Um, Remember, tough trip through hell. Thank you. Howdy, y'all. My name is Ryan J. Lau, and I will be portraying the role of Blue, one of the three so-called innocents in the next production by Lockdown Theater, A Tough Trip Through Hell. Essentially, the innocents serve as a Greek chorus type for this little western that we have put together. We're very much looking forward to it, and one of the things I think I hope that everyone will be impressed by is how very technical this is all going to be, especially for us. Thank you, and we look forward to it, and we hope that you all enjoy it. Well, how to do there? My name is Stagger Lee Cole, and I play White in this year's show. And let me tell you something, it really is a tough trip through hell. Why, my partner's red and blue. Why, we three make up the gang called the Innocents, who work for the evil Sheriff Henry Plummer. And, well, uh, let me tell you something, he's a no good dirty vermin if you ask me. Why, he makes us commit all these dastardly deeds for him. And if we don't do him right or to his liking, yeah, he shoots us. I mean, what kind of boss does that? Well, I may be the youngest in our gang, but I sure ain't the smartest, let me tell you one thing. Well, I think you should come see our show because it's got a lot of cool things in it. I mean, we 
there's cowboys, there's there's a horse in it. Oh, wait, there's even some singing action. Are you ready for a musical? I wouldn't call it a musical exactly, but I sing in it, and my partners do too. Oh, we got a lot of good stuff lined up for you. And you know what? It's pretty crazy out there right now, but you can watch us from the comfort of your living room. Why, you don't even need to leave the couch to watch this live show. So tune in to a tough trip through hell and get ready for some cowboy action. Yeah! <laughs> I had seen a play where the guy won a MacArthur Genius Award and he had like a chorus, a Greek chorus, but it was set in East LA and it was so awesome. And it was just the music and everything. And I thought, I want to do something like that, but I want to do it with these villains, you know? And so David didn't envision a Greek chorus in his novel that, you know, that's a very theatrical thing, a, you know, a nod to the ancient Greeks, right? So Emma took that idea and Rick can tell the rest of that story. So The story of Lucky and Sparks, it turns out we're both musicians and it turns out she's a master musician. She's finishing her master's degree at, at CalArts. So when we first met, we started writing songs together. She pitched me some cover songs. We started playing and learning. And I would had been working on a song for my feature film uh, documentary, the, the River, called Slow Down. And she kind of jumped on board and helped me arrange it, put it together, and polish it off. And so we put that actually in our first show, This Is My Gun. And that was the theme song for that. And so from the very beginning, Emma and I had been working on music for this. After that, it was just kind of a no-brainer because she just got her master's degree from Cal Arts in composition and performance. Then she's done all three shows. And she plays the pedal harp, she plays the piano, and she's got a world-class singing voice. By the way, if you ever need a Stevie Nicks impersonator, she's definitely the one. Uncanny. But for the bridge, we had a theme song in it, and Bruce actually wrote the music into it. And that there was a folk song from the 60s from a band called The Lucky and Sparks. The future, there was a remix of it. So Rochelle's character had that remix of it as her ringtone, and I had the original folk one as my ringtone. And that was the icebreaker, how we both started uh, talking to each other on the bridge. And so we had to record that. And she has a studio at home and talked us through how to do it, and we arranged a song. And on this one, she's using the pedal harp and if you guys have seen that it stands about five feet tall and you change the intonation with pedals there's eight pedals on the floor there's three positions for each pedal so you're using both hands like this and then you're changing the position of the pedals to get different tones it's a beautiful ethereal sound that she's written on written this for it. Uh, as a matter of fact uh, i wanted her to be on this and she's saying hello to everyone right now hello my name is emma frost rosticus and i am the musical director of lockdown theater this is my third production with Lockdown Theater, and I just have to say that I am so, so excited for this production of Tough Trip Through Hell. Not only am I using some new and creative sound techniques, but it's a Western, so it's completely fun. And it's exciting to step outside of my normal comfort zone and really try out some new sounds and experiments. On top of this, Lucky and Sparks, AKA Rick Walters and I, have a new and exciting theme song for Tough Trip Through Hell. We can't wait to let you listen to it. I look forward to seeing you all soon, and thanks for tuning in. Hello, Emma. Hello, Emma. Uh, Lucky and Sparks, you guys can find us on social media, but we're kind of a folk band. We talked about the innocence. She wrote each one of their notes and their harmonies on the piano and then sent them. So when you hear them, these are guys who are not singers singing original stuff and it sounds so wicked. I'm looking forward to it. That's one of my favorite parts of the show. It's gonna be killer. Yay! Ooh, exciting. If you personally were in a Western, how would each of you fit in that world? What would you want to be in that world? This includes Bruce and Jordan. If yeah, of course. Western world. Everyone. Everyone. Everybody has to answer. I know my answer pretty quickly, I think. I would be like an inventor. I would try to peddle inventions, try to come up with ways to make people's lives better with uh, knickknacks and things like that. I know that's <laughs> the truth. Bruce, what about you? I would like to be a Wild West doctor. Ooh! Ooh. Yeah, you know, Doc, like Doc Holiday. Maybe a doc. little bit on the shady side, too. Yeah, you'll be your huckleberry. <laughs> yeah. Rick? 
be a homesteader, I think. I want to I want to homestead and be a rancher maybe. Tommy? You know, I I'd like to be an outlaw. <laughs> <laughs> I'd steal gold. I think that would be yeah. Rico? You know, honestly, I like being a cowboy, minus the extra stuff that's piled on because I'm a black cowboy. But another thing that I would like to be, I would love to be a railroad conductor. I don't know. I just... Tommy's going to be trying to rob your train. Yes. Exactly. Yeah. Rochelle. I think I would want to play someone like Calamity Jane. Without so much drinking and being as, like, I wouldn't do any of the wild, wild stuff she did. But I like that she was still free and independent. Sasha, what would you be? If I live in a Western, I would like to be that bar owner that all the cowboys and villains and all these unruly people are gathering there. And I'm the one who says, all right, boys, time to brush your teeth and go to bed. You know? And... <laughs> <laughs> they didn't do a lot of teeth brushing back then. Just so <laughs> yeah, I would be the only one they would listen to. And I would serve drinks there. That would be fun. <laughs> that would be cool. Now, would you be a badass like 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 Calamity Jane? Because you know you're running a bar. Totally. Yeah. Yeah, rough one of those things. I would have to, yeah, to control all these drunk crowd. Of <laughs> yeah. Listen, we've had a great time here and talking about Tough Trip Through Hell. Where can people watch us when the green screens turn into this magical... When can we get whisked away to Virginia City, Montana, circa yeah. 1866? I think you, better, you said it better than I did. Where can people watch Tough Trip Through Hell? We're what going for it? three locations. We've got... Uh, Twitch, YouTube, and Facebook. Uh, best way to be reminded is probably Facebook because you'll get, uh, you can go into our event and join the event and then it will remind you of the stream and then take you straight to it when the time comes. Okay. But if you like YouTube, we're on there also, Lockdown Theater. Uh, Lockdown Theater also on Facebook and on Twitch. And what are the show dates? It's, uh, the first one is, Rick, it's the 28th, right? Yeah. Wednesday the 28th. 7 p.m. They're, they're quick burst shows, but they're episodic. And what's cool about what we're doing is it's like Saturday Night Live. Once the first one goes live, we have a week to stand up the next one. Right. So, it'll, be uh, five, it'll be five Wednesdays back to yeah. back at 7 p.m. After sure. Tough Trip Through Hell, what is going to be next for Lockdown Theater? Uh, well, we did a comedy now. I know that after two very heavy plays, The Bridge and This Is My Gun, we decided, well, we need to do a comedy. So I mean, we got lots of options. We got uh, a really great script that uh, Rick's friend has uh, uh, submitted to us, right, Rick? Another Washingtonian and another veteran, Rick Tills. Yes. Yeah. Uh, he wrote the resolution. He's he also writes children's books. He writes children's books and horror movies. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We're going to be busy, and hopefully, our troop of actors will want to stick with us. And yeah, hope. So we have a crew here that can basically make short work of a table read. And from breakdown services to directing to administration, you name it. What what makes this happen, we talked about it briefly but not in depth, is the ability to break down the workload and then disseminate it amongst us. And we're handling everything at the lowest level possible. And we're doing it for, for pennies on the dollar. So right. if you're a school or university or if maybe a playwright that you know wants to stand something up or if just you guys want to get together with us, we can pull this off and we can do table reads. We can do auditions for our, our ensemble. We can do all kinds of cool stuff together. And, uh, and it's instant, almost instant. And we will place some information in your website, obviously also uh, in the description box. And we wanna thank you so much for joining us today. And it's so exciting to see Tough Trip Through Hell very soon. We can't wait. On the Lightning Hour special edition showcasing Lockdown Theater's upcoming production of Tough Trip Through Hell, a Western dramedy five-episode miniseries, we had with us playwright Dr. Bruce Olaf Solheim, PhD. <laughs> Director Rick Walters, who also stars as Sam Wilson. <laughs> Technical director and sci-fi guru, Jordan Martin. <laughs> Actor Tommy Hestmark, who stars as villain Sheriff Henry Plummer. <laughs> <laughs> 
And of course, our very own Calamity Jane, Rachelle Henry. Yeah! Stars as Martha Jane Canary, aka Calamity Jane, and our very own Rico E. Anderson, who stars yeah. as Wise Ezekiel Pompey. Woo! Yeah! <laughs> yeah, we got a little something that we like to do. It's our traditional Zoom photo. Uh, this is basically our version of our red carpet, since we aren't allowed to have that right now in this capacity, and also because we're like millions of miles away from each other. So, all right, so we're about to take our, our Zoom photo, and let's all get ready and say, yee we Thank you. did it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. See you guys. Thank Bye. you very much, guys. Bye. Take care. And this was the Lightning Hour special edition showcasing Lockdown Theater's upcoming production of Tough Trip Through Hell, a Western five episode miniseries. I'm your host, Sasha Kerbel. I'm your host, Rochelle Henry. And I'm your host, Rico E. Anderson. Please support the creative forces that bring art into our pandemic world by watching the virtual shows. And you can donate to Lockdown Theater as well. If you go to their website, uh, you will find all the details. Don't forget to follow the Lightning Hour and Lockdown Theater on social media and give us your like. You'll find the links as well as information about how to watch Tough Trip Through Hell in the description below. Don't forget to follow the Lightning Hour and Lockdown Theater on social media and give us your likes. You'll find the links as well as information on how to watch Tough Trip Through Hell in the description below. Thanks for watching. And our next regular episode of the Lightning Hour is coming this Friday at noon, as always. Have a great weekend, everybody. Bye. Bye. See ya.